see you all. Yay. Okay. So great. Good afternoon, everybody. As a reminder for best viewing, use the icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen if you're on a computer. And you might want to choose the speaker view. This will allow you to only see the presenter along with any slides that they're showing while hiding all other faces or movement or other things that might distract you during the meeting. So as always, thank you for sending in your weekly reports. We really appreciate that um, when you send them in. And we also appreciate the notes that you're sending, telling us how you're progressing, what you're learning and other things. Today's Lunch and Learn is sure to be a lively one. Our guest, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, is not like any other doctor I've met. Today, she will confirm and validate things that we may already know, and that's good. It's good to reinforce our core knowledge about chronic high blood pressure, but she will also challenge our thinking, answer our questions, and maybe even give us some homework to think about because, you know, after all, she is a university professor. Um, thank you for sending your questions in advance of today's session. I have them. If you have other questions throughout, please use the chat function on the Zoom dashboard. And at the Q&A time, we'll get to as many questions as we can. So let me introduce our presenter for today. She's a diehard New Orleans Saints fan, a Zumba instructor, a Reiki instructor or master, I think, a mother, and a phenomenal physician who integrates primary care, behavioral health, physical fitness, and mental well being into her delivery of care at, for every patient. A native of New Orleans, Louisiana, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, or Dr. Yola's background includes degrees from the David Geffen School of Medicine at University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA, and Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She completed her medical residency at the acclaimed Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, where she gained considerable knowledge and experience while working with some of the nation's leading physicians and clin clinicians. She's an associate assistant professor at um, George Washington School of Public Health, where she's one of the school's leading lecturers. She's also medical director of CRC Health and Wellness Group and the founder of Delta Health and Wellness Consulting. Dr. Hancock is an advocate for public health reform, education, and fighting child obesity. We are fortunate to have an hour of her time as she is sought after um, by TV shows like CNN News, Anderson Cooper, and serves on scientific medical advisory boards and is the leading health, and she's leading health initiatives in um, the city with the Boys and Girls Club of Washington, um, Washington, DC. And this is a huge one. Um, for most researchers, it takes years to get a grant, but most recently, Dr. Hancock, in her first attempt, this is amazing, applied and was awarded a multi-year grant from the National Institutes of Health for her work on childhood obesity and prevention and care. So this sounds like an amazing tool that you're working on. The grant will underwrite the development and deployment of a breakthrough digital obesity management tool that will allow adolescent patients to track their treatment plan progress and results in real time while providing virtual alerts to authorized medical care providers. The goal is for the patient to develop behavioral shifts over a defined period, leading to better dietary fitness and mental health habits. That really sounds fantastic. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Hancock to our Lunch and Learn Forum. Hello, everybody. It is so awesome to be in this space with you. Thank you, Cheryl, for the invitation to be in this space. I know you guys are like zoomed all the way out. Slide <laughs> deck up, right? You're like, oh, here we go. Another talk. What I want us to have is a community conversation. I'm big on talking with, not talking at people. And I want to be able to hear from you 
in terms of some of the things that we're going to cover. So, you know, my passion in this work really is born out of what I saw my family members dealing with. Um, growing up in Louisiana, I saw there being some challenges in terms of access to health care. I love my home state to pieces, but when it comes to access to care, especially for communities of color, particularly Black people, it can be a struggle. And so when I was seven, I watched my papa, my great grandfather, having health issues and in the middle of that, not being able to access a doctor. There was one doctor working in an entire emergency department and I sat there watching my papa suffer. And in that moment, I made a commitment to become a doctor so that my papa wouldn't have to suffer anymore. And it further, as I continued to um, transition into my career, I kept getting reminders of why I feel like I was called to do this work. So I'm spiritual. So you'll hear me refer back to my spirituality. And so for me, it me doing the me, do, practicing medicine and the work that I do now truly for me feels like um, God's calling on my life. Yes, to the boot and the delicious food. And so knowing what my family experienced because of the lack of access to care. And then when they did access healthcare providers, it wasn't always a positive experience. The majority of their experiences weren't like anything I would want for myself or for anyone, whether they were my family or not. And so I've always prided myself on becoming the physician I would want my papa to have. So I want to um, kick off our conversation by telling you a quick story. So you'll learn as we spend time together. One, Cheryl will tell you, I love to talk, um, but I also love to listen. I love to tell stories. So I'm gonna tell you this story to launch off our conversation to talk about how you guys are navigating through the healthcare space, specifically related to high blood pressure, and what are the ways that we can work together so that you become your best advocate. So back in 2019, I won't reveal who the loved one is for uh, to protect against HIPAA violations, but I had a loved one who in 2019 had a mini stroke. We're sitting in my kitchen. I was preparing lunch. All of a sudden, they couldn't really talk face seemed to be paralyzed on one side. They slumped over. I ran over, grabbed them up, called 911 and rode with them to the emergency department. In the emergency department, the person who checked them in was more concerned about their insurance than the time that we were dealing with. Because as you guys like to know, when you're talking about something like a stroke, time is brain. Time is heart when you're having a heart attack. So the faster you can access healthcare, the more um, improve the outcome is going to be. And knowing this information, coming in as a doctor, I was trying to maintain my diplomacy. Dr. Hancock slash Yola always tries to show up first, but this person is near and dear to my heart. I have an altar. We call her Yo-Yo. And every once in a while, Yo-Yo flares up when she needs to, and she's not as diplomatic. And so I had to fight for my loved one at triage for them to take her to the back for her to be evaluated. She finally gets admitted, evaluated. She's diagnosed with having luckily just a mini stroke because of her elevated blood pressure. And in questioning, this person lives with me, I'll tell you. In questioning, getting her history, we all learn, myself included, we learn that she had stopped taking her blood pressure medication about three weeks before this experience. And so I had all kinds of mixed emotions. I'm scared to death because this person is near and dear to me. She's like the center of my world, but I'm also, I'm gonna keep it PG. I was mad. I was, I was uh, in the Bible. It said, this is off it, right? Um, I was really upset. Cause I'm like, one, you stopped taking your meds three weeks ago. And this is after she's been diagnosed. This is two days in. We finally find out that she had stopped taking her blood pressure medication, which all the while I'm thinking she's taking it, right? Both as her family member, and as a physician, I'm assuming she's taking it. And now we're in this predicament. But then I feel guilty being mad because she's had a significant health outcome. And out of that experience with my loved one, I recognize that there are other patients who prayerfully aren't in that same position where them not taking their medication facilitates them having a bad, bad health outcome. But there being a disconnect between when providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, or PAs, when we write out that prescription, and then what our patients do, and whether or not we have created space 
for you, the patient, to first ask questions, have your concerns addressed, maybe even revisit the prescription because you've gone on social media, you've gone on YouTube, you've gone on Google to learn all the scary things about hydrochlorothiazide, and then you've made your own informed decision about what you will do with this medication. And one of the interesting things that I learned after having managed my family member through this health ordeal was that about 50% of adults in this country do not fill their prescriptions with having a chronic disease and it happens for a variety of reasons. And so what I want to do without pointing anyone out, because each of us has our own experience. So you don't have, it's not like, all right, Miss Denise from Oak Town, how come you didn't fill your prescription? Instead, it's the theoretical. I want to hear from you guys for yourselves or for fa from family members. If there has been a choice or just general ideas, talk me through what makes people decide from the time a physician like myself writes a prescription, what goes into the decision about whether or not you will one, get it filled and two, whether or not you'll take the medication. And I think part of having that conversation, one, helps me to understand and the medical community to understand when patients make that decision, but also as a physician and as a person who's been in that space, hopefully being able to work with you guys to troubleshoot when those issues come up. So Ms. Carlotta said cost. That is an excellent reason why some patients make a have to make a decision, right? About whether or not they will fill a prescription. What I will tell you, good, I'm gonna write this stuff down so I don't miss any of it because y'all giving me some good stuff. So one is cost. Ms. Carolyn says side effects. So let's talk cost, side effects, what else? And I'm big into voice. So feel free if you need to, you're like, girl, I don't even want to type this out. I just want to talk to you about it feel free to unmute because we're family now. We, we're just going to have some conversation. So we talk cost, we talk side effects. What else? Anything else that there makes it? Really no discussion on options besides the medication. Excellent. No discussion on options. Just take the meds and that's it. All right. All right. Self-love. Good. All right. I love So I think you guys touched upon when I've asked my patients this question that's these what you have given me are also the top reasons that they have identified so let's break it down i want to sort of pull the curtain back in terms of how clinicians make decisions right so one of the things that people sometimes believe is that uh physicians are in cahoots with in partnership with big pharma right i have heard that there have been a lot of trust issues related to our prescribing habits that somehow doctors will either get kickbacks because we've prescribed certain medications, or if we put you on medication, it keeps you in this cycle, right? So now you got to come and see me every three months because now you're on hydrochlorothiazide mixed with fill in the blank, labetalol, whatever. And what I will tell you is there are certain requirements that we practice under, especially if we work for a healthcare organization. Insurance companies are the ones who really dictate how patients are managed when you, even if you work for yourself. So I own my own practice, but insurance companies at least tempt to dictate how we manage patients. There are certain algorithms and protocols. And when we send a chart in and Miss Tanya's blood pressure is 155 over 92. The insurance company is going to look at her chart and say, did you offer medication, right? Because her blood pressure is X. What they don't want to have to do is pay for what my loved one experienced. They don't want to end up having a patient that they have to take care of and pay for it, end up in the hospital. So I want to just give them some medicine, get their blood pressure down. That's number one. The second thing is that we as clinicians don't, aren't often aware and don't take the effort to find out how much these medications cost. And it isn't that we pick the most expensive one. Most of us, hopefully, practice in what we call an evidence-based space. So if you are an African-American man or woman, what are the blood pressure medications that work best for you? That medication may not be the cheapest, but based on the current data that we have available, this is the best pick if you are Black. Right, And there are certain blood pressure medications that do work better and don't work as well 
depending on whether or not you are African American and data has been shown continuously to support that. And so that's how we make decisions. It's one based on who you are, like from a race standpoint, there are certain medications that work better to what insurance you have. I wish that that was not the case. I'm a big supporter of universal health care, whether it be Medicare for all, somebody for all, because then that takes the guessing game out. I know that no matter what, if we had a universal health care system, I no matter what medication I prescribe you, there's a list that tells me how much your insurance is going to pay. Even with your same insurance, I had one health insurance, right? And I have asthma. One year, my inhaler was $5. Same insurance, the next year, my inhaler was 80 So I feel you in terms of really navigating through. And for some of us, it's a challenging choice to make. If your blood pressure medication is $80 per month, and you live on a fixed income, and then the next year, it's $120 per month, you're trying to figure out where you're going to get that additional $40. And so sometimes we have to make some challenging choices between medications and some of the other things that we need to just survive and sometimes hopefully even thrive, right? And so those are difficult decisions to make, but without a transparent insurance situation, it makes it even harder. And what I will tell you, it, pulling the curtain even further back, is that it isn't physicians who are in cahoots with and, link, and linked up with big pharma, it's insurance companies. Insurance companies and big pharma are the ones that meet up every year to decide the cost of drugs, what drugs will be covered, and how much the insurance company is going to pay for those drugs, just so you guys know sort of the inner dynamics of how these decisions are made. So that's what we deal with in terms of cost. But that's why it's important to come back to your provider and be like, listen, this drug costs X. This isn't within my budget. What are some of the other options? And thankfully, there are enough blood pressure medication options that we can really start thinking through. And I think it's the responsibility of healthcare professionals to have a clear understanding of how much these medications cost. You could be rolling in a Lamborghini or a Yugo. I should still be able to tell you, okay, here are the price points for each of these medications. Here are the couple of options that we have. These are the side effects that some of these are known to be to deal with because someone else brought up side effects. Have that conversation. I don't want you to have to go to Google to figure all of that out, right? Um, the other thing, the overarching thing is trust. In order for me to trust what you're telling me, I need to know how you see me. And what I will also tell you, and this is something that we work on in medicine, is how do healthcare professionals see us as Black people? I have been in spaces with other doctors where it has been said that, well, Black folks don't change their eating behaviors. Black folks don't like to exercise. Like all these blanket, blanketed stereotypical perceptions. And if this is perpetuated within conversations in medicine, it's also perpetuated in how I communicate with you as my patient. And so I heard someone mention behavior change. Absolutely, it should be a core component of the conversation to give what was discussed some options, right? So this is what we do. This is how we navigate through it. And as much as I am a supporter of Western medicine, you will also find me recommending cinnamon and, and aged garlic. And we'll talk about some of those things in a little bit, but it really is a combined approach. And then the last thing that I saw someone say, and I wanna make sure I don't miss anything in the chat, is really focusing on someone mentioned self-love. Um, one of the things that I will talk about, and, and it, it's a little challenging to discuss because it was a relatively recent loss. Um, I just lost a 52-year-old cousin. Um, her funeral was on Saturday. So I'm gonna get through this without fully being away. 52 years old, only three years older, uh, three and a half, almost four years older than me. I'll be 50 next year. Thanks be to the God that I will make it that far and then celebrate another 50. Um, but she had high blood pressure. So the timing of this talk really hits close to home in my heart. She had high blood pressure, was on dialysis um, because she had kidney failure due to uh, poorly controlled um, high blood pressure. And one of the things that my family has talked about, thank you, my love. One of the things that my family has talked about and that I've talked about is how we see ourselves and our ability to advocate for ourselves in terms of decisions that we make and the mental health components of dealing with chronic disease. And this is gonna, I'm gonna go off script a little bit, 
uh, cause I made an outline, but you know how, how to pastor when you go to church and he feels like the spirit has moved him. And instead of Deuteronomy, we're going to go on over to the, to the new Testament and get up in some Mark, uh, some Luke and some Matthew. So that's what we're going to do. One of the things that we really have to talk about is our mental health and how we see ourselves and the inevitability of chronic diseases like high blood pressure diabetes and all of those things, right? So as black people, it's important for us to understand that this isn't some self-fulfilling prophecy simply because my mommy, my grandmommy and my great grandmommy all had some form of cardiovascular disease does not guarantee me that I will have to walk the same path. And it's one of the reasons why I have been very purposeful in the decisions that I have made even when I had barely two nickels to rub together in terms of the dietary choices and the exercise choices that I made personally and the example that I set for my daughter. And I bring my cousin up because there were choices that she made that facilitated her early death. And one of the things that breaks my heart and makes me committed to doing what I do is how much life we lose as black people because of chronic diseases and not having a safe space to have these kinds of conversations. Where we talk, like I will be real with my patients on a regular basis. When they come in here and their blood pressure is still 160 over 90, I'm like, sister, brother, what's going on? What do we need to do? And so one of the things that I have my patients do is they write a letter to themselves or record a video to themselves. And the questions that I ask them, and this is your part of your homework assignment, is if I do not control my blood pressure in the next five to 10 years, what does my life look like? And what does the life of my family members look like, right? Because it's not just that you might die early, but you may have a stroke. And then there are loved ones who will have to take care of you. You may transition early. And then what does that look like for your family? But I don't leave it there. Because then it's in five years after having participated in this program and I am just knocking it out of the park and my blood pressure is much, much better. What does that look like for me? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What is that experience? And I want you to be very explicit. Like it is me not having to worry when I get a headache that that isn't just a basic headache. It is me not having to worry that if my chest starts to hurt, that I don't have to worry that this is my high blood pressure acting up, right? What does that look like, feel like, taste like, smell like for you? And you commit it to paper, you commit it to a video so that when you get ready to slip and dip and get that 12 pack of ribs, mac and cheese and barbecue beans, because that's what we're doing this weekend. It pulls you back in, right? It pulls you back in to remind you because as a physician, I'm here to partner with you and every healthcare professional that you have should be seen as a partner and they should act as a partner. But when it comes right down to it, in those moments when you are by yourself and you know each of us has them, when you are by yourself having to make that decision on your own, it's that internal compass, whether it be the Holy Spirit for those of us who are spiritual, your higher power, your ancestors, your good guy, bad guy on your shoulders, whatever it is, that's what we do to pull us back in, even when it's a decision about whether or not we take our medication. And what I would ask each of you to do is when you are given a prescription, I don't care if the doctor's hand is on the doorknob, doc, I just need two minutes of your time. I know it's important for my blood pressure to be controlled, but this is what I want us to do. And this is what I do with my patients. We navigate a timeline because I don't like, to be honest with you, am I a fan of prescription medications? Not necessarily. I would love for all of us to be able to get our blood pressure down by diet and exercise. But for some of us, depending on how long you've had high blood pressure, what your dietary habits are, what your stress level is, it may require the start of a blood pressure medication with conversation, pairing that with diet, exercise, stress management. And so what I do for my patients is we will do both. And then I say, okay, I'm gonna give us a timeline so that we can start winning us off of the med, right? Or they'll say, no, nah, doc, I don't want to start medication yet. I say, okay, my sweet. Then what's our, what is our, our, our timeline? Let's say we give ourselves two months to get your blood pressure under control with diet, exercise, stress management, getting your sleep together. Like, and I get all up in their business. We talk about stress, who's providing it, what is the level on a scale of one to 10, and how are we managing? We talk about sleep. 
Are you getting good sleep? And we'll talk about that when we talk about management. So we go through all of those things. Those are the things I want you guys to bring to the table. And the things that we'll talk about in terms of management, I want you to write it down. I'll make sure to share these notes that I composed with Cheryl so you have sort of an outline in terms of the conversation to have with your healthcare provider. So when they write that prescription out, you can say, look, doc, I'm giving myself two months to work on my sleep, my stress, my diet, my exercise, and my mental health. If by this point, I have not been able to achieve at least a 15% reduction in my blood pressure, I promise you on our follow-up, I will come back ready to start this medication. But it also depends on the level of your blood pressure. For some of us, we don't have that space to wait. Because if you're all already hanging out in the 170s, in the systolic range, and you're in the one in the high 90s, 100s in the diastolic range, that's more urgent than if you are in the 140s, 150s, right? So there are sort of levels to this integration of how we manage high blood pressure. The other issue that I learned when this loved one was in the hospital is where she got her health information. So one would hope that having a family member who is a physician, that I would be that trusted source, right? But when you are a family member, they see you as the cousin, the niece, the daughter, the grandbaby. You're not necessarily seen as the doctor until there's a crisis. And that's what happened in this situation. Instead, she got on Dr. Google and learned that she should, uh, she could, if she took herself off for a couple of weeks, her blood pressure wouldn't skyrocket, that it would gradually go up. Now, the question was, who, 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 who are we? Who said this, right? She couldn't remember her source. So I asked her, I said, next time you're online, just write down or send me the link so that I know who has your ear, who has your attention. What is it that you're reading? Because sometimes when we are of a certain belief, and we see this happening in social media, right? When we're of a certain belief, we will seek out what we want to hear, right? Instead of going to trusted sources, we will read up, we'll click on the link that tells us what we already thought. It'll tell us what we already believed and we'll just read more of it, which is why on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all you see those recommended posts or somehow Google, when you're checking your Gmail, there'll be all these little links on the side. It's because Google and all these other social media platforms feed you what you like to eat. They will send you all of that information. And so if you Google alternatives to blood pressure medications, they're going to send you that stuff, right? But then they're going to send it to you. It'll be Ray Ray from around the way. He's a DJ, but on the side, he gives medical advice. He has not had a course in blood pressure medication control. Brother may not even have high blood pressure, but he heard from his cousin who had high blood pressure that she drank apple cider vinegar and he wants to go viral on social media so every morning he takes his shot he checks his blood pressure his blood pressure is normal look at me i beat hypertension but no one ever asked ray ray from around the way whether or not he even had high blood pressure and so these are the things that i will tell you and what we know now is that 90 percent of adults in this country get health information from social media and i'm not knocking it I am not knocking it at all, but there are critical questions that I want you guys to ask yourselves, all right? I want you guys to be like investigative reporters. The first thing I want you to ask is who is saying it? So Cheryl listed out my resume and I always try to be purposeful in letting folks know who's in front of you, right? So I'm first and foremost, a mother. My most important role is that of being my daughter's mother. The second most important role is being a daughter, helping my mother and being a granddaughter. My family is most important to me. So being an advocate for them and then a community member, making sure that I show up for my community and helping navigate us through optimal health. And then my fourth job is physician and all of those things. But the expertise that I bring to the table helps to position what I'm talking about, right? So you're like, wait, she's a pediatrician. What's she talking to us about in a room full of adults? The good thing is that I also went back to train and became an obesity specialist. So I'm a board certified obesity specialist, which gives me space to have these conversations in rooms full of grownups. But I also have a background in public health, really focusing on health disparities. So doing a lot of study and research on things like differences among African-Americans when it comes to high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. But a lot of times on social media, we won't know who it is we're listening to. So the first thing I want you guys, when you, somebody shares a link with you, when you tap in and do your Google search, who is the one saying it? 
what is their background? Is this someone who just had high blood pressure? They tried a couple of things, something stuck, or is this someone who's actually been doing this work? The second is figuring out what is their angle? What is their bias? Are they talking to you about high blood pressure? And oh, by the way, they have their own blend of apple cider vinegar or sea moss. What are they trying to sell you? Are they upset with the healthcare system or big pharma? There are a lot of people now who can't stand Pfizer and Merck and all these other institutions. There's some people who no longer trust the government. They no longer trust the CDC, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, even the NIH. And there's some reason to it that you know we can certainly talk about, but be mindful of what the underlying message is. You want to go to what we call an objective place to get information like the American Heart Association, like the National Institutes of Health, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, just to name a few. The third is why should you trust them? So the question even now for you is, why should you trust me? Why should you trust Dr. Yola? The reasons why you should trust me is one, as a black woman, having the lived experience of having family members who are dealing with this. I had high blood pressure. Right after I had my daughter, I almost lost my life to postpartum high, high blood pressure. I pushed my own code button knowing that I was about to stroke out. I ended up on a blood pressure medication drip for three days and on blood pressure medication for almost nine months. So I know the struggle of trying to manage blood pressure and not really even for me understanding all of the physiology behind why I did have high blood pressure. My blood pressure in pregnancy didn't go any higher than the teens, but some significantly stressful events that happened the day after I had my daughter and a bunch of other things facilitated high blood pressure. So my own personal experience with high blood pressure and, high blood pressure and then the experience of being a physician. So be very critical in the folks who give you information, especially when you read it through social media. And then there's the where. One, where did they get their information? Two, where did they get their degree or education, right? Because now in 2022, everybody and their mother has a Facebook PhD and a Google MD. So you want to ask, well, where'd you get that information? Is that from a trusted source? What I will tell you is half the time people, will, I don't even remember where I heard it. I just know that this works for blood pressure. You take the alcohol towel and put it around the back of your neck, girl, it's going to take your blood pressure down. You don't need to take that medication. Well, where did you hear that, right? And then how does what they say compare to what your trusted healthcare professionals have told you and what other experts, even within this space, how does it compare to what other people have said? So it is the who, what, why, where, and how of how you manage information in making an informed decision, all right? So I want to find out from you guys, where do you get your information? What is your trusted, what are your trusted sources of information? Type it, unmute, let me know. Let me check the chat. Good, fun, absolutely. Good books are very important. I think that that is very important, making sure that you guys are, you know, staying connected to, to some good trusted sources through um, through books, right? And there are a lot of different ways that you can do that. There are books about nutrition in general. There are books about stress management. Absolutely, Ms. Carlotta. Um, information that's shared in trusted spaces like this, you know, and I really have to give credit where credit is due in terms of these kinds of spaces. Absolutely. And even like the, not to knock social media, there are excellent sources on social media, but it's important to find out who it is that has our ears so that we know that we can trust these individuals. All right. Trusted sources that uh, thank you for having doctors in their referrals listed to Miss Tanya. Thank you. Now, I will tell you that the relationship, particularly with the black community and physicians, has sometimes been a contentious one. My second year of medical school, or no, third year of medical school, I was shadowing an internal medicine doctor. We went in to see a black woman who looked just like my grandmother. The first thing he said when he walked in the room, do you wanna die? If we both had pearls on, we would have clutched them. We both looked at each other like as black women, like what did he just say? And I didn't know what to do because this is my first rotation of medical school. I was like, is this how we talk to patients? He was like, clearly you do because you haven't done anything I said, making all kinds of assumptions, right? So now instead of being in a position where she felt like she was in partnership with her doctor, she was feeling attacked. He told her, I'm going to write you another prescription. I'm going to up your meds. This time I suggest you take the medication. Writes her prescription, sort of tosses it at her. 
and literally leaves. And I know this is the, thankfully, the rare exception, the rare exception to most people's interactions. But I have seen lesser versions of that when I've gone with my mommy, when I've gone with my grandmommy, both in, in Louisiana, when I've gone with them to the doctors, it has not been a very safe space to have conversation. It was either rushed or very hierarchical, right? I make the decision. I tell you what to do. You do it. So we also have to acknowledge that we as healthcare professionals have to do a better job of creating a team-based safe space for you guys to fully trust us in the information that we share. We also have to address the conscious and unconscious bias in medicine that makes some doctors feel like we as Black people aren't as open to the recommendations around exercise and diet as others are, right? We have to really acknowledge that as well. And that's part of my role in this clinical space is, for lack of a better term, calling out those systems, those blatantly and covertly racist systems that have perpetuated this notion that we can't also benefit from connecting to a nutritionist, from being able to be given space and opportunity for us to do some of these changes on our own, all right? So those are the things that I want us to really work towards together and creating space like this to hear your experiences really helps. But the places where I get my information um, and share it with my patients is, the NAT, is NIH, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, Mayo Clinic is a trusted source, the American Heart Association, I actually serve as a member of the executive board here in the DMV area. So I get to help share information. Like when I come into circles like this, I bring that information back to them because they can tap into a larger group of physicians where we can have these real conversations about the experience, particularly of black patients related to managing high blood pressure. And then familydoctor.org is another space that I like to go to. Um, in terms of getting trusted information. So let's talk about blood pressure management. And I promise you, I'm not gonna go through a whole bunch of pills and all this stuff. I wanna talk just in general about how we navigate through the management of blood pressure. How do we integrate the Western ways of practice with more natural pathic ways of managing blood pressure? And as I mentioned before, a lot of times we have to be mindful of our mindset, right? If we just make the assumption that as a one, as a black person or two, as a person whose family members have had high blood pressure, that this is just written in stone. Like I, this is just something I'm gonna have to deal with for the rest of my life. I have been able to manage patients through getting their blood pressure back down and doing a couple of things that we'll talk about um, this afternoon. The first is acknowledging that there will be changes in your blood pressure throughout the day, which is why I recommend that you measure your blood pressure at the same time every day. And the best time to measure your blood pressure is right when you wake up, before your kids work your nerves, before your significant other causes you frustration, your boss gets all up in your business, check your blood pressure. You wake up, you yawn, you pray, you brush your teeth, check your blood pressure before anything else happens see what that blood pressure is. If you need to, especially as you're feeling certain um, changes in the body and you're like, okay, my head hurts, let me check my blood pressure. Or in the middle of the day, I like to check my blood pressure. Those are the things that I want you to do, but making sure that you are consistent in the timing of it. And then having an understanding that the blood pressure changes based on a variety of things. The first is, as I talked about the timing of when you take it, if you take your blood pressure towards the end of the day, it is notoriously going to be higher just because of the way that physiologically the body works. What you ate is going to impact your blood pressure, especially if you've dipped and slipped and had some ribs. I don't know why ribs are on my brain today to bring it up, but somebody, I'm speaking to somebody, somebody has some ribs this weekend. Um, it also depends on your hydration status, right? If you are even mildly dehydrated, your blood vessels are going to get a little tighter in order to maintain a normal amount of blood flow in the body. A good way to check is looking at your, looking at your pee pee. Now I'm used to dealing with pediatric patients. So I'm going to say when you go potty, right? So when, and we'll talk about that in terms of your blood pressure reading as well, our blood pressure meds as well. That's a very good question. So pay attention to what it looks like in the toilet, right? So if you go potty and it's looking like apple juice, Coca-Cola, that dark brownish, you already know you need to get in some more water. You want your urine to look as close to water as possible. It will have a light yellow hue. That's how you know 
that you're getting in sufficient water, half your body weight in water, not the eight glasses a day. That was some old school recommendation. Figure out how much you weigh, cut it in half. That's how many ounces you need to drink every single day. And if you're exercising, you need to bump it up by about 15%. If you are pregnant, you need to bump it up um, by a good 20% because there's so much flow happening um, within the body. But you definitely at minimum want to get half your body weight in water. If you are thirsty, that's already a sign that you are at least moderately dehydrated. That's one way to help in terms of just good health related to blood pressure control. Um, stress level. We're coming out of a pandemic. Now there's Omicron 2.0, there's Delta Cron, there's like Omicron XE. All these things are happening even as our numbers are improving. There's a lot of stress coming out of this pandemic. A good number of us have lost family members due to COVID. Some of us have been financially impacted by COVID. The isolation of COVID has caused a lot of mental health issues. And then we've been so available, right? What COVID did was just completely abolish the work-life balance because now it's get on Zoom all day, be on your phone all day, answer emails all day. All of those things collectively facilitate stress. The micro and macro aggressions that we deal with as Black people in this country facilitate stress. Political unrest, Ukraine, Russian war, like we're always holding our breath trying to figure out Lord, please don't let this turn into World War III, right? There are all of these things. 31 million Americans may get booted off of Medicaid within the next couple of weeks because of nonsense with the government. And majority of them will be people who look like us. So there are all these stressors collectively. And then there's our day-to-day -day stress, right? It's this, the rent went up. My kid is sick. Like I have a patient now, her son is battling opioid addiction. As we speak, while she's preparing to take this huge exam, that she has tried to sit for, for at least three times. And then she's dealing with all this other work stress. So that cortisol goes up because we're stressed. Blood pressure goes up because cortisol goes up. So it's what do we, what are we doing throughout the day that's facilitating our stress levels going up that cause our blood pressure to also be elevated. And then sleep, when we're not getting enough sleep, cortisol levels also go up. And I'm talking a good solid six to eight, uninterrupted where you can get into some deep REM restorative sleep. And then some basic things like the pressure cuff size. If you use a blood pressure cuff that's too small, your blood pressure is going to be falsely elevated. If you use a blood pressure cuff that is too big, it's not going to register it sufficiently and it's going to read as too low. So you also want to pay attention to the size of your cuff. And then lastly, the environment. There is something called white coat hypertension. So you may come to see me. You don't know what your copay is going to be. You don't know what your wait time is going to be. And you had to rush because you couldn't find a parking space. You come in and the first thing we do is what? Check your blood pressure. We don't even give you time to catch your breath. That can also facilitate elevations in your blood pressure. So what do we do? One of the questions that was asked was the timing in terms of when you take your medication. What I would say is take your blood pressure before you take your medication because I want you to know what your baseline number is, right? When you first wake up in the morning, what does your blood pressure look like? Especially as you are embarking upon this new healthy lifestyle. If you can track that even before medication, your blood pressure is less than 140 over 90, right? And then you take your blood pressure medication and it stays in that healthy zone. You'd be like, high five, sis, high five, brother, we're doing this. It gives some data to show your healthcare provider, listen, before I took my meds, this was my blood pressure. I'm already at my less than 140 over 90. I'm in the 120s even before I take my blood pressure. Where are we now in terms of being able to titrate our medications down, all right? So how do we do all of this together? How do we integrate? You can do both the natural way of doing it and the pharmaceutical way. The first thing I would tell you is you really have to be mindful of where you are in terms of your blood pressure. So I wanna do an exercise. Usually when I do this in person, we have straws. Instead we have mouths because I'm both visual, auditory and kinesthetic. And I like to touch on those learning styles for everybody. So the first thing I want us to do because I'm in the middle of doing yoga training, I'll be done in June. So if you're in the DMV, I'm gonna need y'all to come support me in June to do these yoga classes. So the first thing I want us to do is just breathe through our mouths right now. Deep breath in. Mouth open, breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out. Now, the next thing I want you to do is purse your lips like a fish, 
lips real tight, like you real mad. You about to like, you trying to call on the Holy Spirit so you don't cut somebody out. Lips real tight, mm, your angry face. Now, breathe through your mouth, just like that. You might spray a little spittle, that's okay. Cause you're probably by yourself and nobody's going to be exposed to spittle. So talk to me, what's the difference? Either type it in the chat, let me hear your voices. Breathing out, mouth open versus tight lipped breathing. What's the difference? Anybody notice the difference by the raise of hands? Yeah, deeper. Tight. You can barely exactly. breathe. Yeah. You can barely breathe, right? So that's what I want you guys to think about in terms of your blood vessels. So relaxed blood vessel, not dealing with hypertension, mouth open, full breath blood flowing from the heart all the way from the brain down to the feet. But with hypertension, blood vessels get real tight, just like your lips got tight. So now in order to breathe out, you have to force more air out, right? It's not as easy to breathe that air out. Air is still trapped in the, in the chest and you have to do, use more force. In the same way you physically use more force to blow that air out, the heart has to use more force to pump that blood out into your blood vessels. That's why we have to be as aggressive as we can in terms of managing blood pressure. So depending on how high your blood pressure is or how long you've been dealing with blood pressure issues, that will determine whether or not there is space to do diet, exercise, stress management, mental health stuff first, or if we have to do it in what we call series. So it's either parallel where we sort of run things together or we do it in series. We do one first and then we do the next. When you have significantly high blood pressure or blood pressure for a long period of time, you've been to the doctor 50, 11 times and every time they go in there, they tell you your blood pressure's high, your blood pressure's high, it's been six months, what are we doing? So length of time or elevation of blood pressure, that's going to make things happen in what we call parallel, meaning we can start meds and we can really work on diet, nutrition, um, exercise, stress management, et cetera. If your blood pressure is not significantly high, like you're in the 150s or they just finally identified you with having a high blood pressure, then we can navigate and negotiate. Doc, for the next couple of months, can I really focus on nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep, getting all my stuff together, optimizing my health? I'll come back in three months and then this is what we do, right? That's where we sort of look at how we make this decision. That's how I navigate and negotiate with my patients. I say, well, let me look at all your records and see where your blood pressure has been over these past several months. If we have documented that we talked about diet and exercise back in 2020, and we in 2022, and you didn't caught the COVID-15 or the COVID-50, and we're still working through weight management and those sorts of things, what I don't want you to do is experience tight-lipped blood flow while we're still trying to figure this out. I want you to be able to optimize your nutrition and your exercise and your stress management while simultaneously protecting you, your heart, your blood vessels, your kidneys, all your organs, your brain, all your critical organs. I want those to be protected while you are working to achieve your best health. And that's how doctors who are comprehensively approaching high blood pressure and patients who are comprehensively approaching high blood pressure will work together to navigate through this, all right? So let's talk the herbs and spices, because I promised I would give you a little bit of that. In terms of the, the herbs and literally spices that help with managing blood pressure, I always go based on evidence. Evidence supports the use of aged garlic in terms of helping to reduce blood pressure. There have been a couple of studies that have shown that using aged garlic can reduce blood pressure by at least 10%. So if you're in the 150s, that'll take you down to at least the 140s, right? It's some progress. It's not perfect. It's not going to take you from hypertensive to fully non-hypertensive, but it will at least help in terms of the adjustment. And that's two capsules per day, all right? The second is cinnamon. I told you it would be spices. So cinnamon, 1,500 milligrams. There have been studies to show that 1,500 milligrams of cinnamon per day, not the like, don't go to your, your spice cabinet and Throw out some tablespoons. That'll mess your tummy up. But uh, capsule, encapsulated cinnamon, 1,500 milligrams uh, per day. And I would divide that by two. And this isn't, I always have to make this disclaimer because my malpractice attorney would bring my neck. This is not medical advice. These are suggested recommendations based on current evidence. Um, and one of the things I want to mention, because this has been out a lot, is apple cider vinegar. There has not yet been a study to show 
the effectiveness of apple cider vinegar when it comes to blood pressure. I get that almost every single time I see a patient who's coming in to see me to manage high blood pressure. I was told a shot of apple cider vinegar will help with my blood pressure. Not even in animal studies has apple cider vinegar been shown to be effective in controlling blood pressure. It does help with managing blood sugar. It also does help in terms of weight. So take it with a grain of salt while you manage through your apple cider vinegar treatments, all right? Stress management, a breathing exercise. 90 seconds of breathing exercise will actually bring your blood pressure down significantly. Studies have shown that. So especially if your shoulders are all the way up to your ears and you're feeling real tight, separate yourself from whatever that situation is. Go to your centered place, pray, meditate, breathe. 90 seconds is all I ask. If you start incorporating that into your daily practice, that will help to bring your blood pressure down. Thinking about things like what are your sources of stress? And are these sources of stress things that you are voluntarily experiencing or is it a non-negotiable? So is there a relationship that's stressing you out that you know you needed to let go of a long time ago? Is there a job position? Whatever the things are, identify those things because you have to prioritize self. Self-care is not selfish. In order for you to show up for everybody else, you have to show up for yourself. And a huge part of that is stress management. And if there are places where you don't feel like you can uh, manage it on your own, I'm a big proponent of therapy. I have a counselor. I see, I lay on her virtual couch on a regular basis so that I maintain my own healthy levels of stress and being able to show up for everybody else, all right? Um, sleep, getting in your full six, eight hours. We talked about if you snore when you sleep, ask your significant other, your family member, do I snore? I need you to ask them that question today because if you snore, you need a sleep study. If your doctor has not recommended that you get a sleep study and you now have confirmed that you snore, I need you to ask them, may I have a sleep study? Because we know that obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for high blood pressure, all right? And last but not least, sugar. So we always talk about salt. Cut your salt down, go get your Mrs. Dash. She got sauces and spices now. But what we don't often talk about is that sugar is the diabolical um, twin of salt. Sugar plays as much of a role in high blood pressure as salt does. So the recommendation is no more than six teaspoons of sugar in total for women, no more than 12 teaspoons of sugar in total for men. I will tell you one soda has about 60 uh, grams of sugar in it, way beyond the 25 grams of sugar recommended for women or 50 grams of sugar recommended for men. You also have to be careful of juice drinks like Ocean Spray. They have more sugar in them than even a 12 ounce can of soda because sugar causes our blood vessels to become stiffer. And we wanna be lax and relaxed as we optimize our health. For salt, you guys likely know this already, no more than 1300 milligrams of salt per day, which is about half a teaspoon in total for your 24 hours within the day, all right? So I want you guys to really be able to talk through your plan, figure out what your goals are gonna be. Based on the information that we talked about today, I want you to explore your sleep. Am I honest with myself and getting my good full six to eight hours uninterrupted? If not, what is it that I need to work on? Do I need to turn that TV off, turn my phone off or at least away from my headboard so the flashing light from all my Instagram notifications isn't waking me up? What am I doing in terms of my stress? Scale yourself on a scale of one to 10. How stressed out am I? And what do I need to do to get myself from a 10 to a five? Nutrition, if you need assistance, I'm always available and there are other resources. Connect with someone. If you don't know what you're doing in terms of nutrition and you feel like you need an accountability partner, tap into your networks to get that person. This isn't an easy journey. Sometimes who, who be calling us, y'all? Like I had a personal relationship with Pepsi when I was in college. I finally released that demon because I was starting to develop what's called osteopenia. I was getting old late bones, weak bones in my 20s. I was like, I rebuked that. So me and Pepsi broke up, but it was a struggle. I had to be purposeful in not being in spaces where Pepsi Cola was going to call my name. Setting goals for yourself in terms of exercise. It doesn't mean going out and doing yoga and Pilates. It could be doing a, a little $25 Aldi Lidl recline bike that uh, helps you while you're watching the haves and the have nots. Those are the kinds of things to really think through. And last but not least, advocate for yourself. Do not let a physician, NP or PA, give you a prescription without talking through side effects talking about your options and asking them, why did we select this medication? That is, those are going to be critical questions. Why this medication, doc? 
and not one of the other blood pressure medications? How does this work for, for Black people? How does this work for me? And can we pair this with my own personal goals? Can I meet up with you in three months to revisit what we're doing? Because there are doctors who are of the belief that we will never get off of blood pressure medications. And I exist in practice to show them wrong. And I love being in these spaces to help you guys do the same. So that's my spiel. I want to make sure I jump in and not miss any questions. All right. Let's see. We absolutely love you. Thank you. <laughs> and you didn't even take a sip of water. <laughs> and I have it here just in case. And see, so here's what I do. This is what I do because I, in my office, all around my practice, I believe in surrounding myself with positive affirmations that encourage me to be my best self for me and for my community. And so my mug, re, my this and this is a Black Girl Magic, a sis created this mug, it sold at Target, shameless plug. Be gentle with your soul, patient with your growth and kind to your mind. Mm. That's what we leave here with because you guys showing up does all of this. Your commitment to self, to your family because you've committed to yourself is all of this right here. So kudos to you. Ashe, yes, Ms. Carol, Ashe, because that's what this is about. It's we now have choice for the most part. And I didn't even get into some of the social stuff, right? So a lot of so I do a lot of social advocacy because the choices that we make based on our diet, our exercise is also determined by the environment in which we live, right? And a lot of that is driven by policy. And a lot of that policy is driven by institutional racism, like gentrification and all of these things. And so it isn't always as easy to engage in physical activity if the area in which we live, our parks are run down, right? If they decide to put a Whole Foods in Southeast DC only because the white folks have now showed up. Like we over here with this bootleg giant for decades, they now have revamped it because Amy and Becky and Karen are running down Alabama Avenue. We have to advocate collectively and individually to make sure that everything that they get once they flip our communities is present in our communities before a flip even begins. So that we can make the choice to have healthy water, right? Because that's also an issue. If I can't, if all I can do is buy my water because I can't trust the tap water, that becomes an issue in, of, in and of itself. If I can't cook with this water, that becomes an issue. And so I want to make sure that I at least respect the space that some of us live in, that sometimes the healthiest choice is not going to be the easiest choice, not because of our own efforts, but because of societal efforts. So I want to make sure that I uh, acknowledge that as well. Dr. Yola, there are a couple of questions that did come in during registration, and you touched on it a little bit at the very beginning. What is a mini stroke? And if someone has a mini stroke, are they likely to have another one? And then related to that is um, if someone has a stroke that is not disabling, what is the difference? Between Very good question. So okay. a mini stroke is when there's just a tiny, tiny area in the brain that gets impacted by the blockage of flow. The question is whether or not that blockage gets released and then blood flow starts to happen again, which is why I said time is brain. Mm -hmm. If you are diagnosed with a stroke in a sufficient amount of time, healthcare providers can start you on a medication called TPA. It's a clock buster. But in order for them to use the clock buster, they have to know, is this stroke because of a blood, blood blockage or because of a tear in the blood vessel? If there's a tear in the blood vessel, and you have got, had a stroke, they can't put you on this medication because it actually would cause you to bleed out further. But if they can identify that this is a blockage of blood flow, they can give you this TPA medication, open it up, which is what happened thankfully with my loved one, where she was able to fully recover. In terms of these non-disabling uh, strokes, when you have a stroke, if you do not change your behavior, there is a high likelihood that you will again, develop another stroke. This is why, like I've had loved ones in my family who survived a stroke, didn't have uh, significant complications, didn't change their behavior. And within the next uh, three to five years, then sustained a significant stroke where they ended up being disabled or ended up dying from a stroke. And so I always say the body leaves, gives us whispers, right? And you have to be really in tune with your body in order to hear it. As an example, I was telling Cheryl earlier before I jumped on, I felt myself stressed. This weekend has, was very stressed because the loss of my cousin and a bunch of other things happening. I checked my blood pressure before I showed up in front of you guys. I was like, I have to be fully authentic. If I feel my shoulders up to my, my, shoulders up to my ears, 
Let me see what my blood pressure is looking like. And so it's paying attention to what the body's telling you. This mini stroke that my loved one had was the whisper. And that's what I told. I said, this is the whisper. The body will scream at you in a minute. It all depends on what you do. And so pay attention to those signals so that we can decrease our risk. And a lot of it really has to do with how we treat our bodies in terms of the food that we eat, especially after you've recovered from something like a stroke or a heart attack. Um, my significant other, and he gives me permission to talk about it, he had a heart attack um, last year and we completely changed how he ate, especially right around, right after he had his heart attack because that's when inflammation really starts to set in. When you have something like a stroke or a heart attack, all of these, the body sends off all these chemicals that can cause scar formation. And because of that scar formation, that also adds to the increased risk of having another stroke or heart attack. You want to eat the cleanest you can after something like that. So as inflammation shows up in the body, you give the body what it needs to decrease that level of inflammation to decrease the level of scar formation that happens after you've recovered. Here's another question that was a little unusual. I'm not sure if you know. Is it possible to obtain the medical records of a recently deceased parent in order for me to know more of my medical history? That's a very good question. You can ask for it. The challenge is um, their medical directives. If you were not given durable power of attorney, a mm -hmm. healthcare provider, because HIPAA lasts through death, right? So my ability to release health information lasts even after a patient has transitioned. But if you had durable power of attorney and you were the one that were, was able to make health decisions for your parent, then you would have, you would be able to get their medical records to get that information. Okay. Um, one more question that came in during registration. All of my doctors are Black. What are your thoughts about racial bias amongst our own? Oh, we, that's a whole nother workshop. <laughs> just because they, just because they, uh, skin folk don't mean they can folk. Um, I have been purposeful in trying to find uh, Black doctors myself. I can tell you that as an adult, the only doctors that I have had, uh, minus one, has been Black, and I have had to fire uh, the majority of them because there is the connectedness and the trust in having another Black person, but there's also the way in which certain people practice medicine, right? And it goes back to that whole level of hierarchy. I don't often reveal that I'm a physician when I go in to see a doctor because I want to just be treated like everybody else. And what I have found is not that they aren't good doctors, but the system creates a rushed experience, right? And so I'll come into it with very minimal questions because I'm relatively healthy. All I have is a little bit of asthma, but like my last physical, I'll use this as an example. If she sees it good because it's a learning lesson, I won't drop names because I don't do that. <laughs> but... <laughs> I never got out of my scrubs. I was in my scrubs, my sneaks, and my sweater. The medical student listened to my heart, listened, looked in my ears and my mouth. She came in. She asked, were there any significant findings? He said no. He was a third-year student. They knew I was a physician. And then that was my visit. I was in shock because I was, again, I'm very purposeful because I know that there are certain questions, there are certain considerations that I will get from another Black doctor that I wouldn't get from somebody else. Like when I was pregnant with my daughter, I... I would have gone through hell and high water to have a black OB, a black woman OB, because I knew my risk of maternal mortality. And I had seen experiences with my colleagues dealing with white male OBGYNs where the black woman's concerns were poo-pooed. Even her partner, when I had a concern, he was like, that's not that big of a deal. You're over-exaggerating your symptoms. I was told this as a physician. And so I was like, oh no, oh no, she, everybody got black on black on black. I'm, I'm, I'm voting on everything black. But we have to recognize that even within our own circles, how we practice medicine is not the ideal way of doing it. Black physicians will also assume that Black patients aren't going to change their behaviors in order to improve their blood pressure, in order to improve their blood sugar. And that's something that we have to also address within our community, especially when it comes to things like obesity. There's this assumption that if you're dealing with obesity, it's just simply because you're sitting around eating all day. And I've had these conversations with other Black physicians where I have provided correction. So I think that that is definitely a conversation that we have to have in terms of giving our patients agency, that this is a team-based approach and not a hierarchy. Thank you so much, Dr. Hancock. This has been an amazing hour and a few minutes. And thank you for all of your time.
Thank you for keeping everything very plain language and real with all of us. And um, if you will, repeat your homework assignment for us because it was excellent, an excellent assignment. Absolutely. So you, you have, I'm giving you three assignments. Are y'all ready? And I'm going to email these to Cheryl so we can reiterate because I'm, I'm that A student, right? And you go above and beyond. So the, the first thing I want, of course, girl, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is how we get these spaces. So the first thing I want you to do is to really think through and ask, answer this, these questions either in written form or video form, because you're going to have to come back to this. Write yourself a love letter or create a love video. The first question is, if I don't control my blood pressure within the next five years or so, what does my life look like? And what does the life of my family members look like? The second is in the next five or so years, when I do control my blood pressure, oh, we y'all, what is that going to look like, feel like, taste like, smell like? And the third part of that is what do I need to get there, right? What does that look like in terms of my own personal decision making, my family support? Because you know, we all got that auntie, niece, cousin who's the saboteur. She gonna show up with the ribs and the mac and cheese. Like, girl, you can just eat two ribs. That ain't gonna make your blood pressure go up too high. And she's already survived her first stroke. We got to recognize those saboteurs, right? So those are the questions I want you to answer either by letter or by video. The second is just more critical analysis, understanding what is the person, who are we listening to, especially when it comes to social media, right? You guys are going to be your own investigative reporters in the information that you gather. Who is saying it? What is their bias or, they, or their anger? Are they trying to sell some products, right? And I saw some questions about me taking new patients. Like, I didn't show up here to swoop you up. I'd love for you to come see me, but I came here Black person to Black person to make sure I show up for my people. So what is their angle? Do they have a little apple cider vinegar store on the side? Like, figure that out because they'll push you a product at the end. Why should you trust them, right? What is their background in terms of the information that they're sharing? Where did they get their education? information, because it may just be hearsay, how does what they say compare to what you know instinctively to be true and what you've heard other people in your circle say? And lastly, when did they share this information? Was this from 10 years ago? They're giving you recommendations. Like you look at the post date, it's from 20, uh, 2005. Well, all these recommendations have changed since like 10, 15, 20 years ago. So pay attention to that as well, all right, in terms of your trusted sources. And then lastly, really focus on what your health habits are in terms of the management of blood pressure. I want you to really be honest with yourself in terms of your sleep. Is it six to eight solid uninterrupted hours? And if not, what is it that you need to do in order to get that uninterrupted sleep? Is it acknowledging that you do snore? I know some of us, especially us ladies, we don't like to admit we snore, but come on sis, we may snore and we may need a little CPAP. If you already have been diagnosed with sleep apnea, put your CPAP on please. So we can take that out in terms of getting us off medications to control our blood pressure. Pay attention to your sugar and salt intake. Try to get in some form of physical activity. Notice I didn't say exercise, physical activity. I don't care if it's dancing it out, doing a hallelujah praise dance once a day to release stress and get yourself moving. And then last, but certainly not least, um, stress management and talking with your healthcare provider so that there fully is a team approach. Ask the questions. Don't let anybody rush you out of that office. I don't care if their hand is on the handle. Doc, thank you for the prescription. I just got one quick question. How'd you choose this medication and what are my options? Is this the best one for Black folks? Is this why you picked this one? I just want to know so that as I take this medication, I have a full understanding from a health literacy standpoint to know why it is you picked this one. And can I pair this with some of this other stuff and see you in three months to get up off this medication? And then you'll also know because the body language, what they say to you will give you a sense to know this is the right and safe space for me, or do I need to find another PCP, cardiologist, et cetera? Because if they're giving you a lot of resistance, like what do you mean by I prescribe you this medication? No, you, you pay insurance or pay some, you pay time, if nothing else, you deserve an explanation in terms of medication choice. Here you go. We got a homework to do. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you so much for this time. You know, You're you welcome, patience. my love. You can always stay connected to me. I'm on social media. Ask Dr. Yola, A-S-K-D-R-Y-O-L-A, -A, Yola from NOLA. And my website is askdryola.com. Look at you yeah. with the slide already. Yeah, we're ready. <laughs> 
So here's Dr. Yola's contact. And um, thank you to everyone who came out and who did their lunch with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm receiving those vibes. Yes. <laughs> you guys are so welcome. Thank you for showing up for yourselves and for your families.